Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. We're continuing our series of webinars, and today we have one of our most favorite guests, Sharon Wilsey. Um, Sharon, this is your 11th? No, I think like 14. Oh, geez. <laughs> <I've lost laughs> but anyway, we just keep, we, we enjoy each other's company so much that we just keep doing these webinars, and we kind of drag you along on these um, sort of like conversations that we just have. Um, you're yeah, welcome yeah. to ask questions, pop it in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, we'll ramble on for about an hour or so. <laughs> oh, it was a video I was supposed to show. Oh, I remember what it was. It's this little elephant. It's this elephant from Safari and somebody said I should, so uh, I should. Uh, so you go ahead and introduce yourself. I will find the video. <laughs> I'm Sharon Wilty. I'm the author of Horse Speak, the Equine Human Translation Guide. Horses in Translation and the upcoming Essential Horse Speak. So uh, Horse Speak is about the body language of horses, and it's a uh, research project that I was involved in for about a decade, decoding the body language of horses into like micro gestures, postures, and signals, and then uh, emulating, teaching people how we can emulate that core language system with our own body language to open up the door for conversations with horses, which has a lot of benefits like helping them become calm, helping them trust us more and developing rapport that we're looking for. So that's what I do. And Sharon and I met at Equitana in 2019. Is it only 2019? It feels like a million years. Um, 2019. I know. Yeah, it feels like a million years. Okay, yeah. why isn't this? I found the video, but I'm struggling to get it. To okay. Open. Hang on. Um, yeah, we met at Equitana and um, we were uh, positioned across from each other in the aisle, which was a very clever German thing to do. I think they're like, these two Americans should be next to each other. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so Wendy came and grabbed me and was like, horse speak, whatever that is, I want it. You come and do, see what I'm doing. And I was like, okay, Wendy Murdoch and equine balance, but it's short foot. Oh, you're okay. And it was just true love at the first sight. So, <laughs> so I've been told about Sharon many times and and actually very recently, just before we went to Equiton and people were like, you have to meet Sharon Wilsey. And so there she was. And I was like, okay, well, and I was off to a demo and I just brought her along. And and it was just, that's kind of been a relationship ever since. We just kind of follow each other around. It's fantastic. Yeah, and it's like, so occasionally our paths cross and a lot of times they diverge, but we always come back on the webinar so we can share our experiences. So, um, so, Sharon, when I did the webinar on Friday about horsing around international safari, um, one of the things we do when we go on safari, and actually this was super special, we were invited to go behind the scenes at the Sheldrick Elephant Orphanage and actually be out with the elephants, which oh. is like super special, very, very unique. Um, because it's not open to the public due to COVID, but um, I have a connection and she arranged this for us. So we went in the back and saw the Ellie's before they came in for dinner. And what happens is they're, they're out in the park because it's literally part of the national park, which is right next to Nairobi. Um, and the Ellie's start moving up and there's a watering hole and mud for them to play with and, and everything. And we were able to go out and interact with the elephants. So we could pet them and we could mingle with them and they were all great, except there was one little elephant who uh, is the bad boy and he's, he's a little bit too um, uh, pushy around people. So the keepers kept him away and then he pro proceeded to perform for us because he couldn't come near us. Uh, um, and so I have that video and I've queued it up. I'm pretty sure this is the white one because it looks like him. And um, I would just love your take on this video and what, what you think this little elephant is. A quick, quick question. It, was he performing like he was acting out to show off or were they asking him to do tricks? They were not asking him to do anything. He was uh, acting out because he was not allowed to be with the rest of the okay. elephants and us. So okay. it, was, it was definitely a protest. <laughs> Okay, but, super. but because I played it on Friday and people loved it. And then somebody said, well, show it to Sharon and get her take on it. So, <laughs> um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to show it to All you. Right. And I've turned the sound off. Um, well, actually, uh, why don't I turn the sound on the first time? Because then you can hear his name and you can hear what yeah, the yeah. does. All right. Okay, Adam. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What's his name? Undeni. Yeah. 
And it's a little boy. He does not like being over there. He wants to be with us. You know, you know it's why he's there. Yeah. Yeah. With him around, there's no peace. Uh, oh, he bugs everybody. Yeah, especially when there are visitors around, you know. You know, like like kids, they know they cannot get that discipline in front of visitors. So uh, he just wants to do oh, what he wants. Just being a show off. <laughs> Somebody behind you. Oh, he's got a whole yeah. Oh, he is filling up. Look at yeah. this yeah. <laughs> And of course, this other elephant comes over to him, right? And she's oh, yeah. she's an older elephant that's uh, at Sheldrick um, because she needs extra care. Mm -hmm. Very calm. Calm. Uh, All right. So I'm going to turn the sound off and uh, do you want me to play it again for you or do you want yeah, to? Just... Yeah, it's really fascinating. Okay. D did it play smoothly or did it break up? It's a little choppy, but it's, it's kind of like sl slide by slide. So in a way that's kind of neat to see the chunk down version of, of body language. Okay. So, so here's where I zoom in a little bit and I'll just kind of slowly drag it. And it's interesting because he's going down on his knee there. Yep. He goes down on both knees and he's fanning his ears. Now I don't, I haven't studied elephant body language enough, so I can only go by um, indicators like direct connection, like he head first connection versus going to the side. And what I do know a little bit about like this kind of thing, when, when an animal typically does this kind of grinding into the ground thing, it's sort of a it release in this case, a release of frustration like they'll, they'll do that behavior. I've seen elephants do that for different technical reasons, like they're um, digging in the mud or they're, they're rooting something up, but they'll also do it as, a, as an aggressive display and where the ears are fanning so wide, there's a little bit of just frustration, aggression, but being down on the knees is he's taken himself out. He can't charge if he's on his knees. So to me, it's, I don't want to anthropomorphize it, but it's a little bit temper tantrumy. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's ah, like, <laughs> and, and look, I'm on my knees. I can't even get you. And then there's an appeal to me. This is this stop right here. I don't know if you stopped it, but yep. this is like a beckon because the trunk is lifted, which is a reach and it's lifted even higher, like reaching and then touching. So I'm wanting, I'm reaching for you. I'm wanting to be touched. I know that they'll spray water on themselves and dust on themselves. And so it's a, a seeking to me, it's like a seeking behavior. And he follows that with going sideways. He goes off the trail to the side, picking at the branches, lifting his head, flattening his ears. And to me, this is showing his shoulder like a buddy up position. Come on over, it's fine. Look, I'm not gonna get you. I'm gonna pick the branches. I'm just picking, I'm just looking for food. I'm not doing it. Look, I'll go this way too. So I'll show you one side, I'll show you the other and I'll drag my trunk around and I'm just like, I don't mean you no harm. I'm not, I'm no problem at all. Why are you standing there? And then there's another little temper tantrum there where it's sort of a flick. There's more of a eh, eh, eh. like, no matter what I do, you're, you're not coming and I can't get those guys to go away so that I can get to you and do whatever, you know, and I would say that he is craving attention. Obviously he's craving affection. And then here, when he just <laughs> throws himself <laughs> to the ground and, and lies flat and just sort of like ah for frustration um there's a there's a little bit of sadness in this moment and you know like he's flailing and he's frustrated but he's also disappointed and because elephants are so emotional right they're, they're just so yeah, yes right so there is kind of like almost like a giving up like ah i just want you know if this was a child i'd i would hear that moment the kids going but i win it you know kind of thing <laughs> And then here, there's the beckoning again, and his trunk is low, his head is high, his trunk is low. So to me, he's like, oh, this, you're coming. Like the elephant's coming, right? But then he's also moved himself to the side of the trail to make space for her, because obviously she's, you know, above him in the pecking order. And he comes and there's a greeting there, there's a quick greeting. And I think that she's offering him to come with her, like scooping him up. Mm -hmm. And there's a little, there's a little nurture moment with his head in her flank there. Yeah. That would kind of be like the, 
Now they have, um, their teats are in front, not, they don't have an right. udder, they have teats in front, but that's a similar like see seeking milk, you know, kind of a, um, a positive like um, affection moment. But then she passes by like, well, I'm going this way. So, and then he's like, fine. I'm not, now that I've touched her and got a little bit of attention from her, it's soothed him. So I feel like he's approaching the guards to say like, look, I feel better now. Can I come in? And, and, and that it was so interesting that uh, the keepers um, were just talking about how he's kind of an elephant that the others are, uh, how do I call it? They seem to be socially engaged with each other and friendly and able to be with people. But he, he had, he reminds me of a horse that um, hasn't quite figured out the social arrangement. Yeah. So because he can't do it in a polite way, so he has to be told to stay away because he can't do it in a polite way. And yeah. then, you know, but he's he yeah, he absolutely elephants love the attention. And I um I can actually just show you another quick video of um uh where did I find how that? how did my elephant speak go? Yeah, I think it was really spot on because he, you know, he was really frustrated, but at the same time, he's not uh good socially. Right? right. And I think that that's the problem is that, you know, he's just not got the not got the hang of it no. um, the way the other elephants. Let me see if I have another uh, video here of the. Um, and so, Sharon, when we think about other species, then it seems like there's a lot of uh, similarity that we can look at between the two species, you know, different species. And I know that you've been working on some of that. I have been, yeah, there's <laughs> there's more similarities and differences, but then you like a species with horns is gonna use horns. And so head down is uh, more about, I'm, you know, it's, it can be an aggressive thing. It can also be a playful thing, but head down is a lot more serious if you're a horned animal. Mm. Then if a horse drops their head and exposes their forehead, it's more of an affection because they'll use that flat surface specifically to rub on each other and it's, it's kind of a friendly button but you know horned animals don't if you pat them where between the horns are they don't like it because it's it simulates head butting so that's kind of an interesting distinction but as far as face forward like i'm looking at you versus face away or shoulder in versus shoulder away foot in versus foot away showing the flank showing the back of the belly these kinds of things are demonstrating that scooping motion like that female elephant did it's not a big scooping. It's not like she went, hey, but it's, there's sort of a, eh, eh. it's like in, out, as opposed to walking by him like that, like an evasive motion. Mm -hmm. So they're really, really good at using the flat surfaces of their body in all the ways that we would use pointy fingers, palms, um, palm down, palm up. There's a lot of gestures that we do. We get away with using our palms and our hands and our fingers and they use the flat surface of their body to have a lot of a similar kind of gesticulation. Yeah. All right. So I've got another little video here of just, just a short one. I got two little short ones, uh, just so you can see some other elephant interaction or elephant behavior. So this is the uh, behind the main offices. And so, you know, here you can see that there's elephants in the background here and they're busy mostly eating. That's what they spend a lot of time doing. And we could be around them and they weren't, um, uh, uh, you know, trying to like invade our space, I guess is probably right. the best way to say it. And uh, let's see, I think this is the other one that I was just gonna show you just so we have another YouTube mm. thing. I'm gonna stop that share and start this share. Um, Here we go. Yeah. And so you can see that they're, you know, when we were there, um, their primary focus was food, whereas the other little guy, his primary focus was us. <laughs> right, right. And he's, he is displaying some kind of, you know, emotional anxiety. And that would make me think, well, why is he here? Like, did his mother get shot? Like, is that well, what all the here? All the elephants that are there are there for a reason. Um, I can't remember his uh, exact circumstances, but the good news is last time I was there, they had like 30 babies and now they only have 13. So Ooh. the good news is that there's been a huge decrease. They're there either due to poaching. Sometimes they're just found. Um, sometimes they fall in wells. 
Um, yeah. Or, you know, if there's drought conditions, their mama might not be able to take care of them. So, uh -huh. um, but what is so fascinating, and actually it would be really fun someday to have you have you come in and interact with them because what they do is they take these babies and they bottle feed them for like six years or more. I mean, it's crazy how long they have to bottle feed them. Very expensive, special formula. But when they get to a certain age, like I think it's, three or four, they move them from this nursery out to other places where they're still interacting with other orphans, but they then get to interact with wild elephants. Oh. And so they start social and engagement with wild elephants and then ultimately they go off and they're, they're able to go off whenever they choose. But there's a, it's really fascinating because there's such a connection back to their keepers. And when these orphans that have gone into the wild have babies, they bring them back to show the keepers. Oh. bring them back and say this is my baby and and oh. you know and that's where you realize the intelligence of these animals is so unbelievable and their whole social structure is so fascinating um in the herd and the matriarchal herd um right. and how they interact so you know it'd be really fun sometime to um to uh go to africa yeah and go to yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah i would love to I, I think it would be for me, just the immersion in groups of animals too, like not only Ellie's, but there's you know, all the other, you were showing us pictures. I, for me to have that kind of in-depth immersion, I think I would just be like making <laughs> copious files in my head. And, you know, like, <laughs> oh, I saw them do this, ah! you know, cause. Well, it, and it, what I'd really great. love you to look at is the behavior of wildebeest. <laughs> oh yeah, I know, that would be interesting. Because um, when we were there, we went, um, the first safari, we had to go way down toward the Tanzania border to see the migration. But the second safari, we'd had more rain and they moved back up into the Mara. So we drove out, we were on a, on a crest of a hill and we looked out on one and a half to two million wildebeest. I mean, it was like unbelievable. But what's so fascinating about wildebeest is that somebody will start to move and then everybody's like, oh, it's time to migrate. <laughs> they just start trotting or cantering along. And it's like, who said what? And why did they wow. leave now, you know? Um, and it's a, it's a really fascinating thing to see that's the herds of that size and this mysterious um, connection that they have that somebody says, hey, it's time to go. And everybody goes, okay. I mean. Did you hear about uh, the, the research they did on, I think it was fallow deer herds voting did you hear about that? No. So this was this was some time ago. I don't. It was within the last decade, but it was it popped up again. You know, like things float around and yeah. pop up on your phone, and I'm like, whoa! So I went down that rabbit hole, um, like probably last year. But there is uh, there's research that somebody somebody did on these fallow deer that they they're on this pre preserve, and so they were studying, watching how they do things, and they noticed that you know there's different water holes in the area, but the deer would agree or seemingly they would agree to go to one water hole, not another. And so they, it was really predictable that um, at a certain time of day, they would start getting ready to go to one of the water holes. And so they set up you know, cameras. And when they went over the footage, what they recognized was that the herd was would kind of break itself into three groups, not like separating, but there was like three um, main groups within the herd. They're all eating and doing their thing. And it'll be, um, deer would lift up their heads and look in the direction of one of the water holes and then go back to eating and another group would do the same and look at another water hole and then the third group would come up and decide which one and so when the third group came up and the bulk of the deer looked at one particular water hole then all the deer would pick up their heads and that's where they went and it was consistent so there so it's like voting is a real thing so it's possible that the wildebeest are making some micro gesture there's some and it kind of ripples through the herd. And there's like a, if it's a million of them, that might take a little while. So yeah. the ripple effect might be like, you know, community communication, like far and wide, but at some point there's a mass of them have agreed time to go. You know, it, there's so much we don't know about how species communicate. I think that's the bottom line is we really don't know. And, you know, it's so easy to kind of make these um, black and white kind of statements, but there's so much. So somebody's asking what a ripple effect is. So like, you know, if you 
throw a rock into a pond and there's ripples that come out from the rock and each each ripple is um, going to be visible on the surface of the water till it hits the shore. So it's basically when one thing gets like a, in other ways, a domino effect, like there's an, as there's a starting point, but then there's a movement of that acknowledgement through the entire herd. So like, like ripples on the water. That's what I was meaning by that. And, and so I just realized I have some other really great video of elephants in herd setting, but also in relationship to us and that, well, in relationship to us because we happen to be there. Um, but I'd love to show you this little bit and just get your, this is like, like talk to Sharon about elephants <laughs> day. <laughs> I don't know, it's just kind of what happened. Somebody <laughs> asked and uh, this is what we're doing. Um, and so if you're enjoying this, great. And if you have questions, you wanna do something else, talk about something else, just pop in the chat. Um, so what was really fascinating here was that we saw these elephants coming down this mud hole and they were so relaxed that they didn't even worry about us. Now, when you're in a vehicle in Kenya, the animals don't see the vehicle as a threat because there's no hunting. So they came down and wound up in this mud hole and you can see that there's this little tiny baby here and these are a couple of moms, right? And so they're in, oops, sorry. What happened to that one? I don't know. Uh, oh, that was, wait, I have a longer one on that. Hang on. Yeah. Um, okay. Hang on, I got to find it. I thought that was it, but Wendy and her poor organizing uh, videos today. Um, that was my problem yesterday too. Let's see. Oh, maybe this one. It'll take a second to load. Um, but it was so fascinating to watch their interaction because, you know, there was one matriarch who was clearly uh, like she came in and said, I want the mud hole. <laughs> and the others were like, uh, okay, I guess we better give you the mud hole. Cause she was kind of like pushy about it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I, th I think this is open. <clears throat> yeah. That'll be neat to see. Yep. Let me see if I can get it to open. Um, in the meantime, I have another little short one. This was just another little one while I'm waiting for that one to open. Okay. Wait, what can you see? You can see that. Okay, great. Uh, I'll just drop this. Out. So I'll just let that one play while I'm finding this other one with the mud hole experience here. And I'll just, uh... oh, but I do go back over and you can see them. Yeah. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Wow, that's a big matriarch. Yeah. Um, and so she's like, I'm going to get the mud hole. <laughs> Um, but they were, what, what was so interesting is how relaxed they were around us. And normally they'll be, um, ears out, trunk out, scanning. And they were like, you know what? We don't care about you guys. <laughs> yeah, totally. And you know, what's neat is she's not actually kicking them out of it. She's just doing her thing. She, she inserted herself in the middle <laughs> and then it got larger. <laughs> You can be here if you want. You might get, you know, you might get kicked, but or rolled want, on, but rolled on, but you know, that you be you. But I'm I'm gonna be me, and I'm bigger, so I'm gonna do this. Yep. Oh, this is the one. Um, actually, I think the other one just loaded up. So let me. Uh, no, wait. Okay, no, that one's still going. Hi. I'm 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 talking with Sharon Wilsey about elephant behavior. <laughs> Brad just popped his head in. <laughs> oh, hi, Brad. <laughs> you know the image that just popped up when you said Sharon Mosley and elephants? What? That scene from Spock where he jumps in the tank with a whale. Oh, yeah. <laughs> doing the Vulcan mind meld with the whale. Can, can you hear what Brad's saying? Who's doing a Vulcan? Oh, Spock does the Vulcan mind meld. Yes, with the he whale. says yes. this is kind of like this Vulcan mind meld. Hang on, let me find this other video. Where is it? Uh, yeah. Okay. But you can see, well, I'll just let this one finish since it's still up and I have lost the other one today. I'm just not hugely organized, but you can see that how relaxed they are and how near to us. And so it's, it's fascinating because then you can really truly see the elephants interacting with each other. You know and, what else is neat? What I what? just saw, can you back up to where yeah. this, this female that just backed up 
um, yep, gotta find my go, back, go back to where she was near the tree and the big matriarch was behind her because there's a right here stop right there for a second she does this interesting thing here with her feet so she balances on opposite diagonals right there oh and then there and, then there. and she swings and looks over her shoulder at that matriarch now stop right there for one second she placed her right front foot in the path of if that female if that big matrix was to walk forward then go back one one click there you'll see there see how she put her right front foot there and the matrix looks at it oh yeah so that's a signal that horses do too that says i want this space i want to be over here and she's in the bubble by doing that but she can't make it happen because she's lower in the hierarchy but she's saying hey i'd like to go this way and then she puts it back again. So it's polite. So when the matriarch sees that, and then she steps all the way away and then demonstrates, uses the hind leg to say the same thing and then steps forward with that right hind leg to move out of the way to make space. So basically she's saying, I'm stuck here. Can you move so I can go there? And look, the, the other elephant goes around behind her. That's right. And then she backs up and that's her way of saying thank you because she wanted to turn around. She was feeling stuck between the vehicle and the tree. So the matriarch understood that and said, yep, here you go. You can turn around and come this way. How cool is that? <laughs> oh. yeah. All right, so that's let me stop sharing and see if I can find this other one. We'll do one more elephant uh, but video. You need to see that because horses do the same thing and I, I would guess probably a lot of four-leggeds do that kind of thing where they place a foot in the path of another to say and not to claim the space but to say this is the path i'd like to take and they can also do it to say i'm taking this path like that when that big mare came, big mare big mama came in she put her feet like i'm taking this path and they had to just move over uh, but the other one was like, you know, I need to take this path here and you're really in my way. And there's a, there's a car and there's people and there's trees. And so the big mama was like, yep, you're right. I need to get out of here so you can turn around. So that's kind of neat to see that in this species because it's so, they have to, they sort of lumber as they do it. You know, it's very defined. Whereas horses can like ding, 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 move it really fast. Yep. So this is the, this is actually before that video that we just saw. And this is the matriarch I was thinking about. And so you have these two little babies here playing yep. in the mud, right? Yep. And then we have on the other side, we have this one. So this one's checking us out. This one's trying to figure out, you know, what we're doing and then decides, okay, maybe I'll, I'll go over here. And you can see that she's, see this one, she, this is actually the, the head because she has this, this tusk that's very yeah. worn. And you can tell if they're a right-handed or left-handed elephant by which tusk is more worn. Interesting. Okay. So she's a left yeah. tusked elephant. Um, and she's the one who's kind of like really unsure about us. She's kind of checking us out. Um, yeah. It was, I mean, it was so amazing because we were in, I mean, look at this, probably 15 elephants, uh, you know, yeah. and we were just hanging out with them. And in years past when the poaching was really bad, which, you know, I've been going since 2008 and there was a period when the poaching was really bad. Um, the elephants were very twitchy and very uncomfortable um, with us and we didn't see them nearly as much, but you can tell that things have changed because they're so much more relaxed and you can see she's still checking us out, but this is when she goes into the mud hole. <laughs> and she's like, my mud hole. <laughs> yes. But she looks at you guys again and she does that signal with her trunk one more yep. time. So it, there's a couple of different messages there. She is claiming much. She's also giving her that looks like maybe her two year old that's with mm -hmm. her or three year old. Yeah. And then maybe like a one year old that's also with her. So she's giving them access, but she's standing guard watching you guys as she does it. And I would say her moving them out is not only to give her her little ones access to it, but also to say, you know, this may not be as safe as you guys think it is. But look at what she does with her foot. Yeah. Can you see that? She picks yeah, up her totally. foot and holds it in the air. Yes. 
Yeah. And then and she again, switches feet. Yeah. Yeah. She's telling him to go light. She's picking up her feet. I think that may be a signal to him. The one that's right there mm -hmm. about go, go do your thing. Like, ding, ding, you know, like horses will start like relaxing the hind feet, start kind of buckling them and doing that sit, that little walk in a circle and buckling their front legs when they want to lie down. And they, they do it as, and then they kind of look around like, I want to lie down or I want to roll. Is anybody going to watch out for me? So I feel like her doing that kind of thing with her feet because they'll trudge through the mud. They'll dig. Yeah, that's what she did there a little bit. They'll use their feet yeah. to flash mud up. Yeah. So I think she was telling him like, do it, do it, do it. Because I don't know how long we're going to stand here for. I don't know. She's uncertain enough that she wants them to get the mud they need because they need mud for their skin. Yep. But she uh, doesn't want to take her eyes off of you guys. So she's kind of like, do it. Come on, guys, get your mud on. Let's go. She also made a really wide circle all the way around you guys. So she circled all the way around to, to look at you from both sides. And she's got her, if she's a left-sided elephant, she's got her weaker tusk on you. Mm -hmm. So then she keeps checking in with you by turning her head directly forward. I think if she was... Um, more worried about you, she maybe would have the left tusk on you because that would be like, I'm really on alert now. So it can be like a little sideways signal. My right tusk, which, you know, I don't, I'm not feeling as threatened because I can stand this way as opposed to she could have gone in the other way and kept that left tusk towards you yeah. if she was more concerned. But she's concerned enough to say, you know, you guys need to go because my guys need to get their mud on. And I'm not, I'm really not so sure about this whole truck thing. And then she obviously gets relaxed enough to be behind the other elephant and not be actually looking directly at us. Um, but we saw her several times and during the, the two groups that I was out there with. And of course, because her tusk is so distinctive, it was like, oh yeah, there you are again. And, and she yeah. would move around us. She was always aware of us much more so than the other Ellie's, which were kind of like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, it makes me think when I, when I meet a really matriarchal horse, and there's other horses who are just less concerned about, they just feel more trusting and, and you'll see, the, or really nurturing. Not, it's not always a female, it could be a male too. And they kind of collect the other horses and go, guys, there's boogeymen everywhere. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, like, and they kind of make them get up or they make them move around and they, they just do some uh, protective gestures. Um, especially when I see younger horses getting educated by older horses that, you know, the, the younger horses want to just play, play, play. And then the mature horses start saying, bringing them to the edge of like the fence line and looking off, you know, scanning the horizon and saying, I know you want to play. And now that you're growing up, you need to kind of be watchful too. So I, I feel like I saw some of that similarity in her yeah. and her attitude. Well, and that little boy that we saw in the, in the first videos, you know, he really does need some some matriarchal influence that can say to him, this is appropriate and this isn't appropriate. But of course, he's an orphan. And so that's why he's there. Um, right. But, you know, just really fun to get your take on Ellie's. <laughs> and right. I, close on, close off. It's that time. Yeah. Again, right. OK. Yeah. yeah, yeah Jackets totally. back on. I started with more. I'm, OK. So <laughs> now let's just talk about Equine Affair because we were both there. We had a blast. It was really fun. Um, there were some. Uh, you know, expos are always kind of interesting because the environment can be really, really tough. Um, yeah. And I, we both experienced that because we were both in a very small demo ring uh, in one building and then in the other arena where you weren't able to turn the horses loose like you wanted to. But, you know, it, it's just it's kind <coughs> of incredible that the horses even go into these environments. And so tell us a little bit about, you know, your experience of Equine Affair. <laughs> <laughs> how to train your dragon yeah <laughs> <laughs> um it was i mean it's always great to be able to do some kind of demo like that where people who are curious or whatever you know they can actually see stuff live or um there was a number of people who've been following us on the club on the uh the horse beat club that we have been doing for about a year like kind of you started this up you know COVID hit and we started up the club and there was a number of club members that showed up and that was great because they're like, oh, we're watching you live. Um, to, to have things when I'm in it, the best, when I, when I can educate the best is where I can have a loose horse because they can have their own agency to 
be a horse and do their thing. And it, it's a small enough pen. So it doesn't matter if it's a round pen, a square pen, but it's small enough so that, you know, I can go around the outside of the pen and communicate over the, the, uh, the bars, right. Or over the, um, the rail, the rail. So that's optimal because now the horse is truly choosing to engage. And I think it's a better educational environment. I think it's easier for people to follow along and it's easier to call it out. And the horse is at liberty to come and go as they please and ask better questions because they're not stuck to me on a lead rope. And luckily I had Laura and they were stuck to her on a lead rope, not me. <laughs> Because there's no way, because you can't do that there. So one of the challenges then you're, you're meeting this horse for the first time and there's protocols that horses have when they greet each other, when they're, when they're meeting a new horse for the first time, that's very clear. It's, that's the easiest time to see it. But even horses that know each other, if they get, if they're in a stall at night and they get turned out in the morning, they'll go through this protocol depending on their personalities. They may be very formal. They may be really informal, but, <clears throat> but it's a protocol and they do it. So we had to like go through the protocol, like lickety split, like, hi, I'm a human. I'm nice to meet you. Okay, but I really mean you no harm. Okay, ready? And pay no attention to the hundreds of people staring at you, holding their breath. Don't worry about that at all. <laughs> and there was one horse that I actually talked to on the fly in the Stroh building, which is the building that has like oh, yeah. the, um, yeah, the, what, what do you call that? That's like breed demo. Yeah. Build. Yep. It's, there, it's more where there's horses in there, whereas there aren't horses in the other buildings. Right. But they're like in these little weird plastic boxes. <laughs> oh, see, I didn't actually go in. I didn't realize. Oh, you haven't. It. It's like these fake stalls that they set up. It's like erector set stalls. Oh, wow. That they set up and there's, they're, they're kind of plastic. Like there's, there's metal and there's bars, but they, they don't feel very sturdy to me. I mean, I can imagine a horse is going boof and knocking them over, but, but I guess the horses believe like, oh, this is real. Um, and there's these, these tiny little stalls and there's all these horses and there was this stallion in there and, and he's just like what is there's a mare over here and what is going on and so I did some um emergency like hi I'm a human you seem to be having a problem because he was just like what <laughs> is happening <laughs> and the mayor would scream and he'd be like am I like what's that are we doing something like what what's happening so um I did a really quick and the owner was like hi you know that was she was very nice so I was able to talk him through the the brunt of his confusion and he got really calm and he started eating hay and drinking water because he was just, he couldn't, right? He was all stirred up and uh, he was a really nice guy. But then, so just when everything is good, an announcement comes over the loudspeaker and he looks at me like, <laughs> what was that? So I start doing the sentry position, kind of looking and looking and look like the doors. Usually horses are concerned about the doors, sure. you know, and this and this. so I did all that and I'm looking back at him he's still staring at me and I went the ceiling and he looked and he was like oh wow so I, like, I said to the ceiling and I said that's okay and he went oh and he took another big bite so in his mind the ceiling is talking <laughs> sure sure actually I I can so remember being on a horse at an expo I uh Craig Cameron was there and he was doing a demo and he invited me to ride in his demo. So I went and got one of my students horses and rode in and then something announced over the loudspeaker above him. And he was like, holy crap, the sky is falling. I wish I'd known now how to blow it away, but um, <laughs> you know, it was, we were okay. But sure, the sky should not talk. <laughs> That's right. And his face, he had like cartoon eyes. Yeah. <laughs> like, how did that yeah. happen? Who's up there, you know? <laughs> Just being able to say we're weird that's just us <laughs> but what a great thing to notice and i mean how many times have horses gone into spaces with loudspeakers and we're we're seeing them react but not recognizing that i mean since their ears are so strong as a sense that it's the where the sound is coming from that's really freaking them out it's coming from a place that doesn't make any sense to them whatsoever and you know my mayor who's now mostly blind uh, her whole life she has always been fine tuned to the sky. She does not like thunderstorms and she's a sentry. And if there was thunder and lightning coming, like it's on, you know, you can look at the, the, the map and you can see yeah, the radar. As soon as it's within five, six miles of, of our house, she starts like this and then she starts heading for shelter. Wow. 
her whole life she's been like that so she's always learned she'd look and she used to roll her eyes and look at the sky and measure like she was like a she was like a, my own barometer it was amazing because she'd be like how fast do we need to get somewhere and depending on the clouds how the clouds are moving we'd get there faster or slower so she always has paid attention to all that kind of stuff oh, and that interest yeah my guys one time we had this horrendous storm when we drove to the barn they're standing in the field they're like okay <laughs> I was like, I'm not going out to get you. You're, you have a shed and you've chosen to stand in the field. I guess you don't mind the rain and the thunder. Uh, yeah, you know, and for her, for whatever reason, she's like, that's not good. I don't like it. Right. And, me, but but the herd me. would listen to her too. So they would move off at her pace. And I listened to her because if we were out trail riding and she started doing that, I was like, I believe you because I've been watching you do this your whole life. So when he was doing that, I thought, oh yeah, thunder and lightning comes from the sky, but not people's voices <laughs> so that would be a really important thing if you're taking your horse to a new environment where there is a loudspeaker system to clarify that for your horses yes um, i had a really experience interesting experience years ago now where i had a portable pa and i could set the the horn it, did, it was battery operated so i could put it anywhere i stuck it on the side of the arena it was a place where i'd been teaching a number of times and then i went down out of the arena and wait, I think I had to go to the bathroom. And as I was coming back up, I flipped the, the sound back on and I spoke. And this horse was like, where's Wendy? And he walked right over to the speaker and he stuck his head right on this because he heard my voice. And he's like, where are you? <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. He was really funny. He wanted to, to, he couldn't figure out how my voice could be coming from a box when he couldn't figure out where I was. Well, uh, I talked to Laura the other day on the phone and I had it with me. I was um, haying the horses and I turned it around so she was FaceTime and I turned around so she could see the horses. She goes, hi, beauties. Hi, my babies. How you doing? Like that. And they're, they pick their heads up more like, and they're <laughs> sniffing the box. They're like, how did she get in there? <laughs> I hear her voice and they're just like, you could just see them like, this is a puzzle. <laughs> Laura, no Laura. Laura, Laura just embodied no. Laura. <laughs> you embodied Laura voice. And the, there's a box and this doesn't make any sense. I'm going back well, to eating. It tells us that they absolutely recognize our voices for sure. Oh, yeah. for sure. You know, um, Def definitely. You know, what's neat about that is they also recognize their names, which is not something that they do. They don't go, hey, for it. You know, your name is he, and your name is who, and your name is he, and your name is oh, like. They don't do that for each other. I think that they name each other through scent because they have a lot of oh. moments where they scent each other extra deep. Yes. And when they're really feeling like nurturing with a human, they'll scent you extra deep. Like they want to really sniff you or sniff the back of, you know, like you've got a pheromone center right here and they like to sniff it a lot or sniff your hair. And I think that's a moment where they're like, like, I know you because I scented you. Like, I, mm. I memorized your scent. And that's a, um, to me, when horses are like, I, I know you, it's that, that scent. And then the, when they are hearing a horse walk, you'll often see them go to try to, who is oh, that? Oh, catch the scent. You know, I, I, scent. I think that's really a good point. And one of the things I've always noticed with Surefoot is when I start doing pads with a the horse, they'll ve very often, they'll start, uh, smelling my hand or they'll come up to my neck and they'll just kind of they're not interested in food or anything they're just checking in right I call it a check-in um, yeah. but a very definite behavior that you can see it's um, with a lot of horses not all of them but a lot of them do that and yeah. and it would make sense because you know I mean I've um, I did a, a webinar um, I've forgotten the gentleman's name now but basically horses have the same scenting ability as dogs yeah and so they're using horses as uh, scenting animals to find yeah. lost people, right? So, uh, I met those people in uh, Oregon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. you can look it up on the webinars. I've forgotten the name, but horse scenting, S-C-E-N-T-I-N-G. Yeah. Um, and it's really cool. We, again, it's, we kind of underestimate their sensory capacity because we can't. So it doesn't exist for us. Well, you know, something that I was, I was just talking to somebody about recently and it really, it was kind of a neat discussion. So I'll just share it here. Um, when we're doing an activity like surfing or skiing or riding a mountain bike or whatever, you know, we're doing some kind of um, nature, we're, we're, it's a sport, you're moving around, you really need to stay balanced. You need to stay, 
you, like if you're skiing, I used to ski a lot, you know, like when the, when the snow has shifted and it's getting icy, mm -hmm. you need to ski differently. Mm -hmm. Right. And you don't have to say, well, how much pounds per pressure should I put on the left side of my foot? Like you don't think your way through, you just do, do it. it. It's because your sense perceptions mm -hmm. have trained, have been, have been taught by falling and that kind of stuff. Like, <laughs> by going whoop and wiping out and that kind of stuff, like how to adapt and adjust all kinds of micro stuff in your body so that you're, you're successful. So you don't hurt yourself and maybe you can even still have fun. So when we're doing anything like that, um, we're using our sense perceptions to tune in to nature and the environment, the weather, all these kinds of things so that we can do what we're trying to do and be efficient and effective and, and try to have fun with it. So when we're sitting in boxes at work, looking at a computer, we're not tuning into the environment, right? So we can turn it on, turn it off, turn mm -hmm. it on, turn it off. Right. And horses can't, it's on. I think they can dampen it down. Like if they've learned, like, this is the only thing you're allowed to do when you're with me, here's the box of behaviors you're allowed to do. I think that you know, they can get, like you've called it slushy, but I think one of their survival skills is like, since I can't, not listen to the environment or not pay attention to it. I'll just kind of go like to like a dissociated state to kind of get through this. But one of the things that we can start doing around them is saying, you know, I need the same set of skills that I would be using if I was riding a mountain bike or doing any other thing where I need to pay attention to the environmental messages going on so that I can really do this well, instead of cutting all that stuff off, pretending it's not happening, which is unfortunately what I think we've learned to do around horses because we're trying to make them, I think, I think in the, in the interest of making them um, serviceable animals when they were beasts of burden for thousands of years, you know, they're sort of just like, well, just do the job, just, just do this one job. And I don't, we don't need to figure all this stuff out, but now we're in relationship soup with them because the only reason now to have a horse is because you like them. So even no, if you I think this is such a really important point to recognize is that this, the, the way we interact with them and the jobs that they do have changed so radically, even in 50 years that, um, that, uh, you know, it's, it's not the same thing. And, you know, it's really funny because people look back at pictures and go, oh, that's, you know, really awful that you did that with your horse or jumped a tall building or whatever, but a, the times were different and B, the serviceability was different. I mean, our whole interaction. So it's really hard. I find it very difficult when people want to look at something historically and make a modern day emotional judgment on a historical piece. Um, I think the only way to make that judgment is to be, to go back into that historical place to make that decision because everything was so different. In other words, it's right. a completely different lens. And, you know, like pre-industrial revolution, when, when horses, that was all we had, right. we also weren't really, there was like electricity kind of was sort of maybe invented a little bit for some things, but we weren't like inundated with electricity in our environment. We weren't sitting in little boxes. You, you had to chop wood, carry water. It didn't matter. Even if you had people to, um, to do that for you, you're still exposure, you know, you're exposed right. to the natural environment. So there wasn't a way to like not be aware of the environment the way right. we can in our modern conveniences, you know, air condition and all the stuff. We, we can just like completely tune it out and like on yeah. purpose, shut it down. Yeah. No, I mean, and that's, you know, when, um, when you look at Facebook, it's so, it's so removed from nature, right? I mean, it's this, it's this contrived electronic thing. And yet we sometimes want to get out there and put, uh, again, when we see a historical piece, we have a reaction from the perspective of the little electronic box versus being out there, being, being in that place, being in that time, being in that environment. And, you know, I think this is where when, when um, like with the Amish horses, it's like going back in time, the horses are, if you will, beasts of burden. They have to work. Everybody works hard. And I haven't ever met an Amish person that wasn't a super hard worker. And the animals are the same in that they do their jobs. And um, there isn't, like I can think of one horse now Then he's in a very different environment, but he's very much um, a reserved horse because any kind of 
warm, fuzzy social interaction wasn't part of his life. Right. Right. Um, right. right. And so, you know, it's kind of interesting when we start looking at our, our current values of relationship in relation to our previous values of, you got to help me do this. I can't do it yeah. without you. Right. And, you know, and back in, I'm thinking like back in the day when ranchers, when, when ranching sort of exploded, um, there is, I, I went to this wonderful cowboy poetry in Arizona a couple oh, yeah. of years ago, and I got to meet these generational ranchers. And, you know, one of their things is like, you know, the, the show world, the sort of Western show world, or like what you see in movies is not, not. like what it's like. And, and the thing is, if, if you're too demanding or too whatever with, with your horse, you, you need that horse. You don't, do not want to get stranded. Right out in the middle of nowhere, because you could die of exposure, you could get bit by a snake, you could. So the the kind of thoughtfulness that these generational ranchers that I was talking to, not everybody is that way, but these, this group that I was with, with the cowboy poetry, they were talking about, you know, implicitly trusting their horses and breeding horses for that kind of intelligent sense, and really giving over to the horse, like you probably know better than me, and, and preferring in a lot of cases to ride mares, especially when cows are calving because they had better cow sense and could move around the mamas and the babies and get, they tended to know like that cow got separated from her calf way before the cowboy has tuned into it. So they were telling me all these stories about like they wish they were like, I wish people really, really knew what it was like because we, and they're, and they're working with their horses too. They're like, we're actually, this is our job. So it's very job. It's very, it's not warm and fuzzy, but there was a tremendous kind of back and forth respect. And like, if the horse is lame, if they're saddle sore, if I'm saddle sore, we can't do our job. Right. So this, this sort of practical, like make sure everything's well. And a lot of walking, that's the other thing. Most of their time was spent walking a little bit of jog or trot, maybe some canter here and there, but they're like, you got to work all day long. You can't, you can't exhaust your horse, you know? Right. So, and I think horses that worked in the, in the world, like taking the, taking the milk to market or something, you know, like the, the working plowing, they're walking, maybe a little bit of trotting here and there, but 90% walking and walking as we've come to discover the latest and greatest, you know, news on health, walking is good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. So, so just, um, Janelle has found the webinar on scenting. It was number 216. It's Laura Adams and Terry Nowalski, and it's equine scent detecting to ser for search and rescue. Thank you, Janelle, for, for posting. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. And so, so we're getting close to the end of this, but you know, it is Thanksgiving week. And, you know, I think that it's, um, it's always a good idea to kind of look back and realize what we're grateful for. And I'm so grateful for our friendship. I mean, this is just, uh, it's just a blast. I love seeing you anytime we get together. It's always fun. And um, it's, it's great. And just, you know, we've come through another year. It's not been the year that we thought it was going <laughs> to be for many people. We thought it was going to be a different year than it was. Um, it's Twilight Zone Part Two. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, like I said, I said in my email that you know it's it's been great to be able to do these webinars and have people like you as my guest because to me it's just it's fun and I um, value your friendship and uh, you know we've, it's been always great to share and it's always great to share with my audience because I have some really loyal folks and many of you are on today. Um, that are, you know, I keep doing this because you guys um, give me that feedback and support me. And, you know, we, we have to be so grateful to our horses that are in our lives. I think that's super important. Um, we are the lucky ones, you know, we get to commune with them. Um, okay. And so, uh, yeah, <laughs> somebody's very grateful they will pop in. We always have people pop in. Um, yeah. You know, it's just been, it's, it's had its challenges this year. You know, I'm still in supply chain hell. Um, <laughs> but you just have to keep looking up and, and making plans. So, um, so I'm just really grateful that, that you and Laura are in my life. Ditto. We're so grateful. I, every time I get to talk to you, I'm like this in the morning. Like, I can talk to <laughs> 
It's so exciting. I am grateful that I got to look at elephants today. Oh, yay. Yeah, that was really fun. Was yeah. Really fun. And um, yeah, and so, you know, I just want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. And even if you don't celebrate Thanksgiving, it's a great time to be thankful when we get toward the end of the year. What I like to do is kind of look back and look at all the positive things that have happened um, and the successes that we've had, because I think it's really important for us to, to take a moment and actually acknowledge that. It's so easy to get caught up in what's not done, and what you haven't accomplished, but I think it's also super important to, to um, take inventory of the, of the really awesome things that have happened in your life this year. Definitely. All right, uh, well, thank you very much for being great, grateful for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me one yep. more time. Oh yeah, it's a blast. And um, we will um, pick webinars back up next week after Thanksgiving. So everybody eat a lot of turkey, lay around and enjoy that tryptophan. <laughs> Uh, if you're in Europe, you could just celebrate American Thanksgiving with us or any other part of the world. Or it's um, harvest time. It's, yeah. it's a harvest. And it's yeah. spring in Australia, so they can have, you oh. know, happy spring. Happy <laughs> Wherever you are, eat some food. Have a good time. Eat some food. Have a good time. Be grateful. Take inventory. <clears throat> and uh, we'll see you uh, next. Uh, I don't know if it'll be still in November or if it'll be in December, but we'll pop out an email and let everybody know what we're doing. Oh, and by the way, I just want to let everybody know I am... I'm starting up a Patreon account. Um, I was telling Sharon before we got on that I have realized that I can share all these articles that I've written for almost 30 years with all of you. So I'm starting with articles and I've been uploading them and we're gonna keep posting up uh, articles regularly. So you can find me on Patreon at Murdoch Method and um, yeah, just uh, another little way to, to, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, oh. I just had this whole, this epiphany. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I wonder if you could make surefoot pads for the little orphaned elephants. Wow, I don't know. Well, actually, they're small enough. I could probably use the regular ones, but wouldn't that but be that cool? little boy? That little boy that was having the temper tantrums. I wonder. Uh, Patreon is oh, it's R, -R E O N. Yeah, I got it. Um, Patreon is if you go to Patreon.com, um, or if you go to Murdoch Method on Facebook. Now I posted a link. It's where you can share content, video content, written content, um, and it's a, a subscription base. So, you know, for a couple of bucks a month, you can get access to different materials. Um, Daisy Bicking's out there. She's been encouraging me to get out there for a while. Um, so I have so much video content and things, and, and I have plans. I have some big plans for what I'm gonna do on Patreon, but we're starting small. We're starting with articles. We're gonna add some video. Um, and so basically it's a place where, I, it's like a brain dump. It's a place where I can put stuff that's been in my computer or rattling around in my head for a long time. So looking forward to it. We might even even start like a, you do a club on Tuesdays, don't you? Yeah. Oh, you want to tell people about it before we get done? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, if you don't know, we it's the Horse Speak Club. So you go to my website, which is my name, SharonWilsey.com. And you, uh, it's it's up there. It's in one of the drop boxes somewhere. It's um, drop down boxes. It's the Horse Speak Club, and for a small amount of money, where we do um, twice a twice on Tuesday, so one o'clock and seven every Tuesday during the month, and so that's eight times a month that you're that you have the opportunity to submit a video or a question, and it's live, it's interaction. So the the couple people that. Um, have submitted a video or a question, you know, get to come on live with their, at least audio. And, uh, and we talk about their video and what they've brought. And then we'll usually drop in a little bit of informational video that we've prepared for the thing too. So it's basically, it's, it is like a club. We have fun. We go over things. We talk. It's, there's not a prescription. It's not like this Tuesday, we're going to do that. And then we kind of like what we're doing right here. We just go, <laughs> hi everybody. <laughs> And if we have a video, so it's one of the things I've been thinking about doing for people with Surefoot that they could send in videos and we can look at those videos and talk about how I'd approach that horse. So that's where I'm thinking that I, I can probably run that on Patreon. I'm not sure what platform you, you use. I think you use a different platform, but yeah, we um, just, uh, well, we were using one and then we're switching all of our, we have all of our educational material on one platform, but it doesn't allow us to organize the videos yeah. So that's a drag now that there's hundreds of them. Yeah. So we're switching to another platform so everything can be organized. 
but that's, you know, a process. So yes, it is. I remember Laura was working on that at Equine Affair. And, you know, it's, it's great that we can do this, but it's also on the backside, just so you know, the learning curve of the different <laughs> systems that are available and whether or not they're going to do what you think they're going to do until you find out they can't do what you think they're going to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You get, oh. And you get invested, you get like halfway through it and you go, oh no, I'm going to have to change it. You know, it's just a lot. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, we, we keep moving forward to be able to bring you great content. And we're so appreciative that you join us on this crazy ride that we are all on. So thanks so much, Sharon. Great to see you. Say hi to Laura for me when she gets home. I know she's flying home today. And uh, she and, has uh, had a great time in Germany. Yep. And and it's, it's just what Janella said is this horses benefit from from all our efforts. And that's really what it's all about. You know, we're, we we want to see that horses are happy. So Absolutely. Yep. Yes. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks for joining us. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.